So we're going to continue talking about brick. We're going to go a little bit deeper and uh, look at some more particular fact patterns um, as we look at the impacts of mobile energy storage and talk about innovation at the local community level. So I'm honored to turn this over to our panel moderator, Daryl Darnell. He's the owner of DTE Consulting and he has a lot of frontline experience in emergency management. Thanks, Daryl. Thank you, Laura. And, uh... Uh, thank you, Laura. And as uh, Laura said, this is a FEMA BRIC initiative, Impacts of Mobile Energy Storage Innovation at the Local Community Level. I'll be the uh, moderator for today's session. And in this session, a panel of practitioners will discuss an innovative new energy resilience BRIC project in Virginia that features mobile green energy storage systems and a public-private partnership between Virginia and Dominion Energy to provide clean energy power during disasters, uh, to disadvantaged rural and tribal communities. This multi-year initiative and project, uh, green power on demand systems would leverage a mobile, or G-Pods would leverage a mobile rechargeable battery system that will support disadvantaged rural and tribal communities electric grid during normal conditions, but can be detached from the grid and deployed by the Virginia Department of Emergency Management or VDEM to predetermine predetermined communities with pre-wire facilities such as shelters or urgent care facilities or critical infrastructure sites such as water pumping stations in disadvantaged communities to ensure continuous power or provide immediate backup power during a natural disaster or other, other catastrophic incidents. Instead of the more traditional power backup approach such as diesel generators or microgrids, that may only address fixed locations. The GPOS innovative approach combines the capture and storage of available energy on a daily basis. It leverages a distributed approach to supplement renewable power generation through multiple GPOS units. And it provides the flexibility to detach GPOS and deploy them to multiple pre-wired locations that are selected and governed by VDEM and local emergency managers. Uh, this distributed approach of this project provides a flexible and scalable strategy that allows more facilities and communities to participate in the GPOT to participate in the GPOTS program in the future. By installing inexpensive quick connect devices at multiple sites, VDEM can create a network of GPOTS ready locations across multiple rural, tribal, tribal, and disadvantaged communities that can accept GPOTS mobile battery unit when it's needed most. Uh, to discuss the GPOTS and tell us more about this innovative project, we'll, how it will benefit citizens in Virginia are John Northen, the Deputy State Coordinator, Disaster Services, Virginia Department of Emergency Management, Donna Pletch, Chief Regional Coordinator, Region 1 Disaster Services Bureau, Virginia Department of Emergency Management, and Jerry Workle, Manager, Electric Distribution Grid Solutions, Dominion Energy. And, and John, let me start with you why this project, why is it important? And broadly speaking, how does this project fit into VDEM's goal of serving disadvantaged rural and tribal communities? Yeah, thanks, Gerald. Can you just quick sound check, hear me all right? Yeah, just hear you, you sound good. Okay, thanks. Well, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, I kind of want to maybe recap and provide some context for folks that might not have been on uh, last year. Uh, Daryl provided a great overview of of the technology we're looking at. When the uh, consortium brought this to, to our attention, we were pretty excited about it. Um, provide a little bit more context within VDEM, because uh, you see uh, you know, Donna Pletch, uh, she'll have uh, a, a, an important speaking role here uh, shortly. Uh, but VDEM, we you know, divided up the state into seven geographical regions. Uh, so Donna is the chief regional coordinator in region one, which is kind of the, the uh, the Richmond uh, metro area and, and surrounding communities. And when we, we looked at this initially, uh, you know, we, we did put it through uh, an equity lens, just coming off of COVID. Uh, we had gone through uh, the drill of, of uh, looking at vulnerable communities. We had data to support, uh, you know, and kind of rank order the vulnerable communities within Virginia. And that's what drove our community vaccination centers and our mobile vaccination centers. So we used pretty similar methodology when this was presented to us of, 
hey, where can we put this and what what good can we can we do and, and uh, you know what communities can we impact uh, the most? So uh, using that same philosophy and structure that we used during COVID, uh, we you know we use that with uh, with the GPod project. So it was it was pretty important uh, within our, you know our own construct within VDEM uh, to serve those communities as best we could. Uh, this really became a, a really good opportunity to go. Okay, well, let's let's kind of drill down and figure out where we need to go. So, last year we really spent the time looking at the overall vulnerable communities. When I say a community, I'm talking at the county or the state level. Uh, and so we overlaid that with the with the Dominion coverage because uh, they're the ones bringing the technology to us and figured out okay, where do we overlap this and where can we where can we put this? So that was kind of that's kind of you know. You know, season one of, of uh, this project. So this year we started to, to drill down uh, a lot more on, okay, uh, we've identified a city, we've identified a county, now where in the county can we do the most good with this? And so that's where uh, our regional staff uh, came into play, uh, doing what they do best, and that's coordinating with the, with the local emergency managers and the local stakeholders going, okay, how do we drill down and found the right find the right neighborhood and the right facility to put this at. And, and that's really where, uh, you know, we, we've been uh, focused over the past year is to, like I said, get more specific that, uh, you know, what we'll call the hyper-local, uh, you know, focus on trying to figure out, okay, now we've identified the city, where in the city do we put this? And that's when we really started to leverage uh, the expertise at, at the, the regional staff, the VDM regional staff, and the local emergency manager level. Thank you, thank you, John. It, it lead, you know, that's a good segue into a question with Donna. Donna, as the uh, chief regional coordinator, uh, I think arguably you have a better sense than most about how the lack of power affects communities um, that this project attempts to serve. So can you talk just a little bit about how you're working with the local managers first to sort of take a look at, you know, which which uh, which locations would, are the best fit for this, but uh, but more importantly, talk about how this will help emergency managers mitigate uh, and manage power outages and really get people back on their feet, you know, in terms of having water, food, shelter, transportation, and so on. Sure. So when we looked at the localities that um, were high on the vulnerability and, and hazard risk scale, um, we looked at uh, we went to those localities rather and said, what's important to you? Um, if the power, if we had an extended power outage, what is um, some of the most important either critical facilities or essential services that your citizens would need during a disaster? Um, and the ones we that were chosen, um, we also had to make sure that they met the requirements for the facility, um, that the load that the, the uh, generator could carry, things like that. So we had to make sure that it, it met certain requirements. Um, in the city of Petersburg, for example, they have a very large number of vulnerable population. And the facility that was chosen there is really the first that I'm aware of of many of these. It is a private entity. So is it, it is a dialysis center. Um, it's licensed to provide dialysis to 94 um, patients. And when the power goes out, if people can't get to that dialysis center, then it ties up local emergency managers and EMS because they're transporting um, people that need dialysis to other dialysis centers. Um, so this directly benefits the locality, of course, because they don't have that uh, resource or those resources tied up. But it also benefits the citizens because then they can go to their regular dialysis center and not have to rely um, on assistance. Um, some of the other facilities that were chosen were like a stormwater pumping stations in the city of Richmond. Uh, those are, uh, if the wastewater treatment plant in the city of Richmond is inoperable, then these pumping stations kick on to ensure that wastewater doesn't back up into residents and businesses in the area. And again, this is in an area that has a, a highly, you know, vulnerable population as well. So um, we just see a win-win for whether it, in any regard, it's a win for the citizens and a win for the locality. Um, you know, and, and in this case, even the, the, uh, the private sector person can continue, they have business continuity um, if they didn't have the, the ability to have a generator. Donna, that's great. And just to follow up on that, I think it really highlights the public-private partnership here in that, you know, working together, the public safety, uh, entities within within Virginia, particularly VDEM, working with the private sector to really work together to have to 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 uh, 
to, to help people be have a sustainable uh, lifestyle, if you will, for lack of a better word, during an emergency. And again, I think you kind of hit on that. But how important is that in, in really in really helping you guys put resources in other places that, that are critical as well? Yeah, that's hugely important. Um, you know, if we have something like a hurricane that's going to hit Virginia, granted the coast gets hit, but then a lot of times we have some of our most severe damage inland. Um, I think John Northern can attest to that. And if we have, you know, we have lots of needs across the state. Lots of localities um, are without power for extended periods of time. Um, our resources are going to be stretched pretty thin. Invariably, when Virginia gets hit with that type of hurricane or storm, um, even a tropical system, and we have those impacts, you know, other states adjacent to us are in the same boat. Um, so having these these uh, generators, you know, that we can take out and hook up to critical facilities um, is really important. It frees up us at the state level from trying to find additional resources as well as the local emergency managers. Thank, thank you, Donna. If I could turn to you, Jerry, and uh, with uh, Dominion Energy, if you could talk a little bit about the technology, uh, how, it's, uh, how, it, how, it, uh, how it works, and how you think it will benefit uh, Virginia in this project. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the technology is is, is very interesting. Uh, it's lithium ion battery energy storage systems, and they are they are mobile, so they're fixed uh, to a trailer, uh, equipped with an inverter and an isolation transformer to uh, couple to the in the source voltage for the local installation. And and you can think of um, actually, you know what? Let me let me come on video for you guys. Just let me back up one second. Oh, having issues enabling my camera. I apologize for that. I'll just continue. But you can think of the device as, as a mobile unit about 40 feet long that has everything on it to make power for the building. And um, they're sized at, at a certain capacity and duration that they can provide power to the building. So the existing buildings that have been chosen for this project, um, they have a source feed from the utility. So what we'll do is we'll drop a permanently fixed switch with a power inlet outside of the facilities. And you could think of it as a source A from the utility or source B uh, from the G-Pod device. So uh, as we work through the project and we figure out what the operations is going to be for deploying the G-Pods, um, we would deploy these to uh, the locations that we've chosen. And upon power loss, the G-Pod would carry the building for uh, a determined amount of time until the battery energy storage system is drained, and then it would be replaced with an additional unit if the uh, utility had not been restored at that time. So, Jerry, it sounds as if that, as, as you describe this, um, that this is very different than from a, from a microgrid. Could you explain the differences between the two? Yeah, so typically, I mean, you could think of them, Daryl, as a microgrid, but typically a microgrid has uh, various different types of distributed energy resources on it. Uh, typically, a microgrid will have wind and solar generation associated with it, sometimes coupled with an energy storage system. But a microgrid is able to, you know, by definition, disconnect from the utility and form its own little power pool and, and carry its load, maintain frequency, maintain potential. So in all actuality, these G pods, when the utility is, is, is lost, um, they have an inverter system that takes the DC potential from the battery and changes it over to AC potential for the building. And it has something called a grid forming inverter. And that grid forming inverter will sit there and um, provide the power as it, the power requirements change in the building. So think of it like this, you know, in a steady state scenario, if 500 kilowatts of power is being drawn out of the battery, then all of a sudden 
a large air conditioner kicks on for the building and draws more power out of the battery. That grid forming inverter will sit there and throttle the controls of the G pod and make sure that we maintain, you know, the proper potential, the proper frequency, uh, which is required by the equipment inside of the building. Oh, no, thank you for that, that explanation, uh, uh, Jerry. I want to switch gears here just a little bit really quickly and go back to John. John, this is this has been a, a you know a two year process, as you said last year. We did the initial grant, the, the initial grant uh, that we uh, submitted to that you all submitted to FEMA, uh, and now you know this week, as Camille said in, in the in the last session, I believe tomorrow is the deadline or thereabouts to submit the second round for the second round of funding. Can you just talk a little bit about how this partnership has allowed VDEM? Uh, to 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 um, to maximize its resources uh, and still do the other things they have to do, but still apply for this grant. Sure, um, I don't want to necessarily speak out of turn because our we, our grants team are, are really the experts there. But uh, by doing this at the state level, we alleviated several localities from putting in individual grant applications, and so uh, and so we were able to to take a look at it and justify it uh, from a state level. Uh, once, you know, assuming uh, the funding comes through, we, we continue to press on with this, prove, prove the concept, get through the scoping project. Uh, you know, I envision this, you know, throughout, throughout the Commonwealth, not just within uh, the Dominion footprint. Uh, and it becomes a pretty critical tool uh, for us uh, at the state and at the regional level to manage those resources, right? Because we could have 100 G pods, and if 101 folks need them, right, someone's going without. So, uh, to be able to manage that uh, from the state side, uh, I think certainly helps. But uh, from, the, from the application side, uh, us being able to do that and, and let tap into uh, our expertise that we have on the staff, uh, I think probably took some of the burden off the localities. And uh, you know, many of the localities, so in Virginia, we have 139 local emergency management programs, and not all of them are fully staffed, right? You know, many of them have one person who does five jobs. So to put that burden on, uh, you know, a one person shop that's already taken care of a bunch of other things, I think we were able to, uh, to leverage our capability and expertise to, to get this turned in uh, with the right, right words, right justification, but with critical input from the localities. Uh, without the coordination with the local emergency managers, this whole thing is academic. Uh, you, know, the, you know, Jerry outlined a lot of the uh, technical aspects, right? So you know, you described it, you know, it's on a 40 foot trailer. Well, we could have, I think we started out with a list of probably 50 facilities as potentials and whittled that down to about like 10, maybe probably less than that. You know, it's like, oh, well, the parking lot's big enough or, oh yeah, that facility, when you turn all the lights on and, and power it up, it's going gonna, it's gonna to draw way too much power. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of work went into identifying just the facilities and the scoping uh, part of the project. Uh, so, so in that aspect, it does put some additional work uh, on the emergency managers, but uh, that's, that's what they do very well is, is at that local level. They, they know they have that information or know the folks that can provide that information. With us handling the grants uh, at our level, we take that burden off of them so they can focus on, on the technical aspects and the, and the ground truth of what's going on at, at a particular facility. No, thank you for that. And, you know, it, it sort of it gets me to thinking that you know, it seems like there's a lot of work that went involved in this starting at your at your level to say, hey, this is a project that we want to move forward to. And I know Donna has done a lot of work uh, in region one and really coordinating the efforts of the of the local emergency managers. But how is it how has it been working with the private sector? Donna had mentioned that one of the sites in Petersburg is actually a, a private entity, a dialysis center. How has the relationship been with the private sector with this project? Yeah, I'll right. say, John, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, well, we, we work with the private sector a lot every day. So uh, so not really anything new. Uh, Dominion Energy is a partner that we've had for uh, for a long time. So uh, working with them has been great. We, we learn a lot every time we work with the private sector, depending on what aspect of the private sector uh, it is. Uh, you know, with a private facility, there's a facility manager. That facility manager is gonna have a lot of questions, right? What are his or her responsibilities? How much is this gonna cost me, right? What, how much time is involved? So sometimes there's a, 
there's an educational piece because not everyone operates uh, in the emergency management space uh, on, on the private sector side. So, uh, but when we actually, you know, show up, you know, the, you know, the old adage, hey, I'm, I'm with the government, I'm here to help. Uh, folks, folks can get a little skeptical, but when they, when they see what we're trying to do and, and, and really understand it, uh, they, they really go, okay, this, this is a good thing. So like anything, private sector or even public, anytime you're partnering up with someone to be completely transparent, uh, kind of, you know, we, we, we do these start with the why, why are we trying to do this? Uh, it really then starts to resonate and, and folks jump on board and they provide great input, right? They'll, they're they're going to come, the, they being the private sector, are going to come with different questions that we're not going to think of from the public side. So to have that partnership really just expands everyone's uh, awareness and education. Great. Donna, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, at first I thought when we went to the private sector that it was going to get, you know, there was going to be some hesitation there. Um, and, and there was a little bit, but they quickly realized, I think that this was really to their benefit. Um, and I actually spoke to the dialysis center director today and they're so excited about this opportunity. Um, they really are. So I think, you know, again, it's just building those relationships and, um, you know, being open and upfront about what we're trying to do. And this is a pilot program. And, you know, like John said, we're from the government, we're here to help you, but it's, um, but it really, they, they're very appreciative. So I'm excited that maybe we can move forward and do more private sector critical infrastructure type or, or essential services, you know, in the future. Oh, great. And Jerry, from your perspective, as you know, as again, a major energy provider, uh, within the uh, Commonwealth, uh, from your perspective, how has is, how is this partnership worked? I think it's been great. Um, you know, it, my team was really involved in doing uh, the initial studies on various sites, and I, I really enjoyed the opportunity this year to um, work with Donna, work with John, work with the All Hazards team to kind of down select the sites. Um, not only educate them on what energy storage is, what it can do, um, but I, I kind of see um, this moving forward that this this pilot project is gonna is gonna teach us a lot about sharing resources and you know knowing from a you know a big picture perspective, um, a lot of times in this state the problems aren't all over the state; they're in little. Uh, little sectors, right? So it, maybe it doesn't make sense to, you know, deploy a generator um, permanently fixed to a location that might use it uh, one time every five years. Uh, we have a pretty good record in Dominion Energy with maintaining con continuous power, but, you know, uh, at a lower cost of retrofitting these sites with um, lower cost switches and being able to share the resources, I think this is a, this is a great idea. I think the team that we have together um, understands uh, and, and, and we're kind of making them all little mini, mini electrical engineers. Everybody's understanding how these G-Pod devices work. And uh, I think as we expand it out, um, we're going to be able to focus uh, even more and uh, uh, really make this project successful. Thank you, Jerry. You know, John, as, as, as Jerry was, was talking through that, one of the things that came to mind uh, as you all came to my mind, as you all were, were developing this project, thinking about it, how does this really relate to some of the some of the initiatives that FEMA has 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 implemented over the last, I guess, two years, eighteen months to two years, in terms of emergency management? How do we reduce pollution? How do we reduce climate change, particularly in these vulnerable areas and things like that? Does this impact some of the some of the requirements or some? Of the guidelines that FEMA is 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 uh, is is sort of you know I won't say dictating but trying to persuade states to 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 undertake. Uh, I'm sure it does. I don't necessarily have all of uh, you know, the FEMA guidelines uh, have, uh, memorized, but uh, knowing you know, reading some of the the, uh, the frameworks that, that they publish, uh, and certainly uh, you know the. The drive towards uh, clean energy, uh, reducing carbon emissions, and this will certainly uh, add to that. Uh, it, it also, I think, takes a little bit of a burden off the, uh, in this case, Dominion, uh, when they're out there during a disaster trying to uh, to restore energy. If we can get uh, G pods hooked up quickly, uh, or even in some cases hooked up before the disaster, uh, you know, we can 
we can certainly uh, re reduce the amount of power outages that are out there or uh, take some of that burden off the private sector as they're trying to restore the energy. Because uh, if I'm if my lights are out, I don't care how they come back on, whether it's battery or or uh, you know a line crew out there working. But the uh, you know the, the green aspect of it, and I, I don't want to wade too much uh, out of my lane, but uh, you know you know constantly charging and, and using um, you know that that green source of power or that green source to uh, store electricity, uh, I think certainly meets uh, some of those criteria. Uh, in the uh, you know reducing that carbon footprint and uh, being more environmentally environmentally friendly. No, that's great. And and I, the other question I'd like to to pose to you, and, and maybe Donna uh, can answer this is uh, as, as well. Uh, seeing as how she's a Region One coordinator, one of the as I understand it, one of the the, the pilot cities is Richmond, and is also looking at the uh, the wastewater treatment plant there. And as we've seen. In other cities across the country, we've learned that that's become a, a major issue. How do you all really see how this project will help, you know, solve or at least, you know, mitigate the possibility of your wastewater uh, management system uh, going out in Richmond during some type of disaster? And how either you or Donna can respond to that. Yeah, I'll say that um, I think that's it's always a possibility that the way wastewater treatment facility can be offline and, and without power during a disaster. So um, these pumping stations, the three of them in the city of Richmond, you know, are going to be critical um, to have power to to make sure that this wastewater doesn't back up into residents and businesses. So um, from an environmental and a health standpoint, you know, it's hugely important. It really is. Um, you know, I, I think even for the other projects, they they all have merit on their own, um, and they're all they're all actually very different. Um, you know, again, Colonial Heights. I, I don't think I mentioned we have a shelter that we're going to put. It's a, a larger shelter than what the locality has. So um, I think all of these projects, you know, have their their own unique um, merits. And uh, again, it's you know really exciting to be on the forefront of this. I, I agree with John. It certainly does meet a lot of the environmental and climate change concerns that FEMA's put out there. John, anything to add to that? Yeah, and I think uh, to kind of add to you know what Donna said, we're, we're looking at within those uh, more vulnerable communities, and so you know you might have uh, a community that's been around for a while uh, that hasn't had any upgrades to their infrastructure, uh, while newer, bigger communities uh, with with you know frankly put more money right there, they, they've probably got generators all already built in, and, and that's working well, but this. You know, community that might have been around for 100 years uh, hasn't seen any any structural upgrades to their uh, their infrastructure, and so uh, while that may cost uh, an astronomical amount of money, if we can at least in the in the relative short term provide some relief of okay, well, we're going to be able to deploy this resource, which will keep the wastewater from backing up into your systems uh, because you haven't had a chance to upgrade that, uh, even though we're we're sort of fixing the symptom and maybe not the overall problem. At least we can alleviate the symptom in the short term, uh, while you know things work themselves uh, through the, through the overall you know political system to to make that happen. So uh, definitely that that focus on on those vulnerable communities, the the impact, the positive impact that we can have with something I say relatively simple, but as uh, I say as basic as just having. Uh, electricity to keep systems up and running to keep that cascading uh, effects from happening uh, is, is going to become pretty huge and that's been part of the uh, the narrative and the ju justification you know uh, you know Donna mentioned the dialysis center and and the reasoning behind it right initially it's like well you know dialysis center it's not like a, an emergency room or a hospital it's like yeah but if you don't have that folks need dialysis right I've, I've got in-laws that they go to dialysis you know every other day they have to have it. And so and if they don't get it there, they've got to get it somewhere else. So it becomes pretty critical pretty quickly uh, without that. So to be able to stop that, that cascading effect from happening earlier in the communities that need it the most, uh, and that's, that's really the, the benefit there. Yeah, John, I, and I really applaud you all. I know from my experience as, as a director of Homeland Security and Emergency Management in Washington, D.C., when we lost power um, at a at a low income housing uh, resident some low income housing residential units, 
And uh, one of the first things that we found out were there were several people, um, you know, that lived in those units that uh, were on dialysis uh, and really trying to figure out how are we going to get the power back up and running as quickly as we can. And we, you know, once we realized we couldn't, we had to send them to hospitals uh, and stuff like that. So I can really empathize with, with what you're saying there. Um, I also, one of the things that I noticed too is, is that the selection of places, um, the diversity of it in terms of the dialysis center, a shelter, you know, a continuity of a business facility, a government operations, the wastewater system. And I think that speaks to um, how broad that this technology can be used. It's just, you know, again, it's not like a micro microgrid where it's, you know, one particular place you can use, you can move this, this G pod around. Um, and But because of that, is there an impact on the capacity, Jerry, in terms of, and I may be, may, I may not be articulating this correctly, but I guess what I'm asking is, because we have such these diversified locations, does that affect the solar capacity or how much energy that these G-Pods can generate? So no, the, the G-Pods will have a, a fixed amount of energy uh, stored within them. So, you know, we we essentially survey each site with with the goal of be, having one G pod, you know, be able to serve the peak load of the building for at least 24 hours. Um, you know, I mean, you could think of it as there would be a larger facility. Uh, if you hook the G pod up to it, it would work, but it it could get drained in, you know, uh, half of the day. And then I think it becomes an operational um, you know, for the for the sake of the pilot program, what you're going to see in the future is capacities of energy storage systems will get more dense. Um, and what today you might have a a G pod that can carry, uh, you know, one megawatt of, of stored for, you know, say four hours. Um, and what that means is the G pod could pro provide one megawatt for four continuous hours. Um, Two years from now, it might be double, it might be triple. Um, lithium ion technology is kind of growing in power density, almost like what we saw in the early 2000s with processor chip uh, speeds. So, um, you know, in all actuality, you know, for, for the in all intents and purposes on this project, uh, the first wave is going to be uh, buildings that. Um, can be served for 24 hours by the G-Pod device. And then as, so, so if I understand you correctly, as the technology evolves, then that 24 hours could potentially, potentially expand to 36 hours or 46 hours, is correct? A absolutely, absolutely. And then if there are, you know, buildings of lesser power, there might be a G-Pod, it's, it's all based on electrical load. You know, every building has a meter. Um, mm -hmm you know, we are able to pull what the power consumption is of all of the buildings. So if, if the load is is lesser, um, you know, the current G-Pod might be able to carry it for three days. Uh, I think there were, you know, of the, the locations that we have identified for um, the existing pilot project, um, there's, there's a whole spectrum of different loading scenarios that we've studied. Uh, we tried to maintain loading scenarios that were we at least be able to carry for 24 hours but some of the sites uh, will be two or three days very good very good so the donna from an, you know again being right there at, you know working mo uh, more so with the local managers how big a deal is that 24 hours i mean it sounds like oh you can only you know keep this running for 24 hours but is that is that worth the effort yeah, 24 hours to them is huge. Um, you know, 24 hours that EMS doesn't have to transport, you know, people to another facility or dialysis center, um, 24 hours to be able to get open a shelter a set of doors and, and have a shelter set up, um, at least have a place to put people temporarily. Um, so yeah, 24 hours is, is certainly better than what they have now, which is in many cases nothing. So Daryl, yeah. this is Gary just to chime in and add something to that. It, it's not just 24 hours. It's 24 hours till the G-Pod needs to be swapped out. 
So you can think of uh, the system that will monitor the state of charge. And as the charge depletes down in the system, we'll deploy another G pod and, and swap it out and regain another set of 24 hour capacity on the system. Exactly. So again, as, this, as that G pod is generating energy, it's able to keep moving from place to place to place. So one G, even though one G pod, one G pod can do 24 hours, that's enough time uh, for another one to recharge and swap that out. So essentially the building is not getting 24 hours, it's getting 48 hours. Is that, is that, am I understanding that correctly? Or, or it could be unlimited. Or it could be uh, unlimited. You know, if, if we had a, if we had a six day outage, um, and you know, we needed to deploy, um, and, and we had, you know, we're, we're purchasing a finite number of G pods for, you know, if this project is funded. So, you know, our resources will be limited to, you know, what is purchased for uh, and designed for this project. But presumably, say we had uh, one location that had a six day power outage and the overall power draw on the building was such that we had to cycle a, a G pod out every day. Uh, what we would do is we would deploy the G pod, hook it up. Uh, we would power the building. Uh, we would have one on standby. And then when the state of charge of the G pod you know, went to a level that, you know, we determined through the engineering of the project that we want to swap it out. We would deploy the secondary G pod um, and, you know, hook it up to the building uh, and then take the depleted G pod to a Dominion Energy location that had power and replenish the electrical storage in, in the device. You know, it sounds, you know, I think this is uh, my own personal opinion. I think this is a game changer. And I think the, the fact that it's scalable, uh, it's flexible, it gives the, the emergency managers the opportunity to put power where power really needs to be. Uh, and, I, and I think that's a great thing. Uh, we're coming up on, upon our scheduled time, and I'd like to leave time for uh, questions if we could. Uh, while we're waiting, if you have questions, I think you can enter them in through the chat. Uh, I, I did not realize that people could ask me questions through my LinkedIn. <laughs> so I want to have to open that up. Uh, but if you if you have questions through chat, uh, please, please, uh, by all means, uh, ask those questions. But but while we're waiting on potential questions, I want to just, you know, kind of close with John. Uh, see if John, if you had any closing remarks uh, that you'd, you'd like to make regarding the regarding this uh, project. I, I do. Thanks, Daryl. Um, I'm just really impressed with the, the true team effort that it's taken to get to this point and that will continue on. But, uh, you know, our, our grants team, uh, being the experts putting all this together, uh, our, our regional staff and our local emergency managers and stakeholders providing uh, that, that key input on, you know, where we're trying to, you know, actually physically locate these when the time comes. Um, you, know, you know, we've also relied on our diversity opportunity inclusion team uh, to kind of validate the info that we had. Uh, and I know some folks ask, where did that come from? A lot of it comes from our, our census tract information, uh, but they're the ones who help put that data together. And, and anytime things are updated, uh, then we get with the locals to kind of validate it. So uh, them working together. And then of course the, the consortium uh, for really getting it started and then the technical expertise from Dominion. So it's been a, uh, a huge team effort, like I said, to get to this point. And uh, it, it's just, it's kind of amazing when you kind of sit back and look and watch, watch that all happen and go from, uh, hey, you know, this is where we got this good idea to, hey, we've identified these facilities, right, and, and narrowed it down. So uh, it, it's going to be exciting to see the next steps of, yep, we're deploying this and holy smokes, it works. So uh, I've just been really impressed with the teamwork to make that happen. Uh, thanks, John. And, and I, just, I just got a question. Do you see this? is a possibility and maybe Jerry, you can also chime in here as well. Do either of you or both of you see this as a possibility of working with multiple states or expanding this, this project to other states using sort of the same framework uh, and, and mutual assistance and, and things of that nature? John, as you know, uh, we have mutual assistance agreements with other states, particularly in region within region three. Do you see this as a tool for that as well? Absolutely. Um, you know, we, we partner with our, our border states all the time, especially North Carolina uh, on hurricanes. And, uh, and of course, you know, any of our neighboring states uh, within our uh, FEMA Region 3, if, 
you know, there's there is definitely some uh, pre-planning legwork that goes into this, right? It's not just identifying the facility, but then getting you know pre-wired. But if we can, uh, you know, we've kind of developed the roadmap on how to do that, and we're certainly willing to uh, share that and, and help uh, other states do that. But then if yeah, if we have this and and we've identified you know surrounding areas uh, that could could use this and, and take advantage of, we you know certainly be uh, more than happy to to share that and partner with with our surrounding states. Jerry, from a from a Dominion perspective. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, the first time in my career I was exposed to shared resources was in the nuclear industry. I mean, it, it, it doesn't make sense to uh, invest uh, the capital for, you know, very rare events. And, you know, across the East Coast, um, you see in the nuclear industry that the different utilities are sharing resources. And, um, you know, emergency plans to deploy uh, those resources during uh, emergency conditions. So I, I definitely see other utilities uh, wanting to get involved in this. Um, you know, it, typically utilities uh, don't jump in. We're very slow to react. We, we like to sit back and um, watch to see how things play out. But I, I'm pretty certain that this one is going to, you know, take traction and uh, want to see some expansion with the other utilities, you know, and I, I do see that uh, this this also being a test case for uh, larger uh, facilities as the technology develops and more it's more capacity dense. Uh, for instance, you can envision a neighborhood uh, going out that is is retrofitted with the source A source B technology and and a G pod working with that. So, you know, although this pilot project may only be going after a small number of facilities, I think the use case uh, is, is, is very scalable. And that's the exciting thing about the project. Well, thank you guys. Uh, I appreciate your time, John, Donna, uh, Jerry. Uh, I think this was very informative. Uh, I think this is a great project, obviously, uh, that you all are doing. Uh, good luck in the, in the uh, grant application process. Uh, and I uh, look forward to moderating this next year, uh, discussing how the pilot, pro uh, how the uh, pilot uh, process went. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate you having us. All right. Thank you all. Thank Thanks. You. Hey, everybody. Let, let me add my thanks to this um, very informative, very expert panel. Uh, it's always great in a program to talk about something at a very strategic level, like we did in our first panel with, with Camille Crane, and then have a, a deeper dive, hands-on, uh, real-world application.